Good evening. This is an extraordinary period for America's economy. Over the past few weeks, many Americans have felt anxiety about their finances and their future. I understand their worry and their frustration. We've seen triple-digit swings in the stock market. Major financial institutions have teetered on the edge of collapse, and some have failed. That was President Bush's urgent message to Americans following a worldwide economic meltdown that would last years. This event in 2008, as we would later see, laid the foundation for what is considered history's largest bubble, commonly referred to as the everything bubble. Instead of one area of the markets becoming severely inflated just as housing was in 2008, we today see bubbles in almost every single sector across the board. The S&P 500 has had strong growth since the Great Recession, and in recent years, the returns have been parabolic. Despite this, average Americans have not really benefited from this rapid rise, and it's easy to see why. Most average everyday people do not rely on stocks as a significant portion of their net worth. In fact, it could be argued that most Americans have a negative net worth, as loans and poor financial planning have resulted in many families living paycheck to paycheck, struggling to make interest payments on massive, unnecessary loans. Rich people, on the other hand, have enjoyed a decade of nirvana. Since 2009, the share of total assets held by the top 1% has increased from 22% to nearly 29%. This may not sound like a giant jump, but this fascinating wealth inequality problem has created an environment where America's richest families control significant, mind-boggling portions of the wealth pie. Here is the simple example that showcases just how bad this is. According to the latest Fed data, the top 1% of Americans have a combined net worth of $34.52 trillion, while the bottom 50% of the population holds just $2.1 trillion. This means that the top 1% is nearly 17 times more wealthy than half of America. In fact, the top 1% has about the same amount of wealth as the bottom 90. This widening gap has grown significantly since the 2008 recession, and even back in 2013, legendary investor Warren Buffett was already raising the red flag speaking about how excellent business returns haven't resulted in proportional wage growth for that bottom 90%. Take a listen to this clip where he explains just how close we came to the edge in 2008 and what the results were following the crisis. Business has come back very well from five years ago when the panic hit. And it was a panic like nobody's ever seen. I mean, whatever you think about it, it was worse. Uh, uh, I, I'm dead serious about that. We were right on the edge of the cliff. Uh, and fortunately, I give enormous credit to uh, uh, both Ben Bernanke uh, and Hank Paulson and, and uh, Tim Geithner, and, and frankly, even though I didn't vote for him, never voted for him, uh, uh, President Bush, uh, uh, you know, I don't know how many of you have studied economics, but in Adam Smith, they talk about comparative advantage, and, 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 and uh, you know, uh, Keynes talked about animal spirits and all those people, but President Bush really came out with the great economic insight of all times, and he did it in 10 words in September of 2008. He went out there from the White House and he said, if money doesn't loosen up, this sucker could go down. And I mean, that, that goes right up there. Tear down those plaques of Adam Smith. <laughs> and, and, and he backed up, he backed up those fellows. And, and so it, we've come back from it. But business has come back. You know, a lot of companies are having record profits, including many of ours. And the American, populace as a whole has not come back. I mean, inequality is getting wider. So the important thing to note from that clip is that Warren thanks three people for essentially saving the country in 2008. Ben Bernanke, Hank Paulson, Tim Geithner, and George W. Bush. Now, nearly 13 years later, following the Great Recession, it's these very people that many are blaming for all the problems we are facing in the markets today. For an example, the former chairman of the Fed, Ben Bernanke, is credited with using unorthodox methods to save this country during the crisis. Under his guidance, the Fed lowered the risk-free rate from 5.25 to 0% in less than one year and then created $1.3 trillion from November of 2008 to June of 2010, using this printed money to buy a wide array of financial assets from banks and from governments. This unusual act is what Buffett credits as saving the country. But for what price? Anybody with common sense can look at a chart of the S&P 500 and point out exactly when the Federal Reserve, basically for lack of better terms, took over the market. 
Fed chairs after Bernanke used his actions as proof of just how great quantitative easing and 0% interest really are. Now in 2021, we have a Federal Reserve that is addicted to money printing, and based on recent actions, we are never going to stop until we experience the collapse of the US dollar. The injection of dollars into the system has allowed the United States to maintain dominance in the world economy. The new saying that stocks only go up has remained true for the past 13 years, and that is largely thanks to this. And the most baffling part about this chapter of history is that so far this policy has been working. We have essentially discovered nirvana. We print our way out of recessions and the US dollar, despite warnings from almost every single economist on the planet, remains strong and stable. However, deep in the minds of Warren Buffett, Ben Bernanke, and George Bush, the truth lingers. What they are attempting is truly audacious, an act that goes against every single principle known to man. Some would even argue an act of evil. Through various medical and biological advancements, our society has discovered ways to prevent life, prolong life, create life, and clone life. With our military technology, we have learned to win wars, without losing a single soldier, and through our innovations and understanding of monetary and fiscal policy, we think we have learned ways of preventing economic depressions. Our leaders make promises of prosperity for all. The world's smartest people argue for a utopian earth, and economics is part of that plan. Actions to me to show signs of a dying society. The general consensus is that God was a great instructor, but we no longer need him. We take over from here. Unfortunately, if you look at history, that usually signals the demise of a civilization. While I'm not arguing that the end is around the corner, I do believe, as Charlie Munger has pointed out, we have already surpassed the apex as a great power and our economic policies are another piece of evidence that this is true. While this money printing strategy has shown great results for the stock market, for normal everyday people, the S&P going up from 1,000 to 5,000 isn't going to change much about their lives. Wages have struggled to keep up with business success, and this massive flood of money has lifted one tiny sector of American society to the top while drowning the rest. In that same clip from 2013, Warren elaborates on exactly this. Take a listen. The Forbes 400, which just came out, showed aggregate wealth for the Forbes 400 of $2 trillion. You go back 20 years and that was 300 billion. So it's up six or seven for one. It's different people to some extent, but this is the top. 300 billion to 2 trillion. And if you read the paper today, you'd have seen that the median income, you know, is the same place it was in terms of real purchasing power. Uh, from 1989, it hasn't changed. So it's, the inequality is getting wider. Uh, the rich are doing extremely well, extraordinarily well. Uh, and uh, business is doing well. Business profit margins are terrific compared to the record historically. Business returns on tangible equity are terrific. Uh, but most, you know, a great many people in our country, if you take the bottom 20% of households, that's 20, 24 million households or something like that, housing, you know, close to six, about 60 million people. You know, it's the top level is $22,000. You know, I don't want to try to live on $22,000 with a couple of kids. So it, we've, got, we've got an economy that is delivering $50,000 of GDP per capita, and we've got an awful lot of people that aren't living well. So it, we, we have learned how to turn out lots of goods and services, but we haven't learned as well how to have everybody share in the, in the bounty that we have. So what will be the end result of these policies? Even back in 2013, many, including Berkshire, were skeptical about this experiment. Yet nearly eight years later, things are still chugging along. As mentioned earlier, the US dollar remains stable and strong relative to the rest of the world. And even a worldwide pandemic wasn't enough to cause a long-lasting depression. Instead, we saw the Fed double down and print even more money. The interest-free rate since the Great Recession has remained zero. Only for a small period between 2016 and 2019 did the government try to carefully raise the rate. But before they could even get to 2.5%, they had to send it back down, and this was all pre-pandemic. Many experts and analysts look at this period as proof of the inevitable, evidence that we simply cannot afford to raise the rates or taper. According to Peter, Jay Powell would rather implode the currency and raise inflation than taper and ruin the economy. This is why you will hear him repeat over and over again that the Fed is stuck between a rock and a hard place. Since the Great Recession, they have jumped into a hole where their only hope is to keep digging down, printing more and more to finance and lift the asset bubble. 
Even before this great experiment was started, Warren had his doubts. While he would never directly acknowledge the severe dangers the system develops, you can hear Buffett the skeptic come out in this clip where he spoke to a crowd at Georgetown University back in 2013. It's a long two minute segment, but it's well worth the watch as it proves the obvious. Good evening, uh, my name is James Fishback. I'm in the School of Foreign Service, uh, first year. It's no doubt that you're an outspoken fan of Ben Bernanke, but no, we, he's gonna be stepping down uh, in January of next year. Whomever takes over the position, do you think that they should contin continue the Fed's controversial buyback program? And if so, for how long? Well, it, I, think, I think they should take Bernanke's approach, which he's, he says he's gonna keep doing it until he sees more improvement in the economy. And I think he's been mildly disappointed uh, and, and not hugely disappointed, but mildly disappointed in the rate of improvement uh, in the economy uh, in the last few years, and therefore, just the other day, he said he's going to ex you know, extend it further until he sees it. So he's, he's not prejudging exactly when it's going to happen. He's telling you the conditions under which he'll, he'll change, and the economy is getting better. We are in... in, in in, a, in an experiment which hasn't really been tried before. I mean, we, you know, we have a, Fed has a three and a half trillion dollar balance sheet and, and uh, uh, buying securities is usually easier than selling securities, as <laughs> sometimes people find out. So uh, we don't know how this game plays out. Uh, what will happen when it, when they actually, if, if they actually try to deleverage the Fed, I mean, what has happened is the American public deleveraged and the, and the government leveraged up through the Fed. When the Fed, if the Fed deleverages that in any big way, that will be, that will be a new experiment. So what does all of this mean for the economy today? The S&P 500 is close to hitting 5,000 and the trend line has it running much higher than this. Those that call for a market recession have been proved wrong over and over again for over a decade, gold bugs and doomsdayers have been largely embarrassed, and even Warren Buffett, who has been hesitant to deploy his large treasure chest of cash, has been ridiculed for missing out on these large massive returns. Predicting when the market will crash, especially in the parabolic environment we are in today, is nearly impossible. Betting against the Federal Reserve is impossible, but that alone doesn't change the fundamentals. Anyone with a world history book knows the truth. Eventually, printing money out of thin air, increasing the wealth gap, and lowering interest to zero is a recipe for disaster. At the end of the day, this endless routine of kicking the can down the road will end, and the stock market will crash as a result. In 1929, the U.S. market fell over 90% in a period period lasting from March 1929 to June 1932. It would take 25 years for investors who never sold to recoup their losses and see the Dow back above those 1929 highs. It's very possible that in the near future, our great experiment comes to an end, and the world gets back to reality, realizing that this nirvana world of curing depressions, pandemics, and recessions is impossible long term. Thank you guys for watching. As always, please make sure you hit that subscribe button if you enjoyed.